Yes? Inspired. Inspired, okay, cool. Yes? Motivate, yes? Guide a team to reach a goal. Yes? Say what? Arrange, coordinate. Yeah? Organize. Take decisions. Take risks. Yeah. Drive performance. Drive performance. Control. Control. Okay. Any others? Plan. Plan. Yeah. Plan. Yeah. Develop the skills of the team. Okay. Small question. If I if I change the question to be, what does a great leader do? Would anything else come to mind? Anything new? Creates more leaders. Anything else? What? People have a positive experience. Inspires. Inspires. the experience. Huh? Uh, the experience. Pass the experience. I see, I see, I see. Share ideas and drive people to achieve. Share ideas, drive people to achieve. Yeah. Impact. That's interesting. Okay, so so we can leave that. That's interesting. So when we when we put the word great in there, all of a sudden we start talking about people more and legacy more, right? So we start talking about our impact on people, uh, making something that lasts, having a legacy that's memorable. I think that's quite interesting, right? That's what we seem to believe makes a great leader. Uh, when uh, this is just what I would say. This doesn't come from some like special textbook or something. Um, for me, when I imagine like what do I expect from a leader? My leader, and what do I want to give if I'm a leader? Uh, it's, it's these things, really. Uh, I want someone who has a clear vision or purpose of what we're supposed to achieve. Someone who can help me perform and drive performance in my teammates, uh, which involves coordination and management and motivation and drive performance. And I want someone that really cares about me and makes sure that I'm becoming the best version of me. Because that's why I'm there, right? So like, I'm part of this team because I, I'm part of the purpose and because I have a vision for my life. And this is the line of that. So I want a leader who cares about me and, and who, who I am and what I care about and wants me to be successful, right? And what we just talked about was culture and behaviors. That's sort of embedded in all of these, right? So, so if, a, if a leader is driving a purpose and driving performance and caring about their people, then in all of those things, they'll want to make sure that they're driving the right culture and behaviors for that team to achieve what it wants to. So I don't, I don't know if this uh, makes total sense to you. This, for me, is like what I want from a leader, and when I am a leader, what I want to give. I, I want to make sure that my team members understand our purpose and that we're achieving something remarkable that will be memorable for the world. Uh, I want to make sure that we achieve it, that we can perform, and I want to make sure that my, my people are cared for and, uh, and they become better people than they were before they were there. Um, yeah, so that's also what I'm going to talk about in this session. I'm going to just break these down, perfect performance of people, and, and some advice from my side on how you can lead and manage your team with these elements. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so team purpose. Basically, I would just say, what is your team fighting for? I like this, this phrase, like, what are you fighting for? And I don't mean, like, what would you sacrifice for, right? Because, I don't know, like, for me anyway, Realizations, or, or like we're fighting to grow, like, I don't know, I don't know that people really fight for that. I don't know that people fight for a number, right? But like, if they understand the impact behind it, then it's something that like really starts to matter to them. I don't know if in ISEC you guys have had the feeling yet of fighting for something. Um, when you do, it, it becomes a totally different game being in ISEC. It becomes a different life if, if in your life I think you're, you know what you're fighting for and you have a feeling of fighting for something. And as a team leader, you want to inspire your team to fight for something. Uh, and you want to show them why this is important and remind them, if you can click again, um, remind them of this purpose and what they're fighting for. Because as you guys know, team experiences are not easy. And it's not just that they're really challenging. Sometimes it's that they get boring. Sometimes it's that uh, coordination isn't good or you have a poor relationship with someone. And you only fight through all of those things if, if there's like a really good purpose driving you. Um, another thing about purpose is that it's like a starting point. So you can't do everything you're doing and then just say you're doing it for a purpose and expect that to drive anything. Like it's not genuine, you know? If, like, think to yourself, what's really your purpose? If your purpose is just driving numbers or something, that's what, that's what you're going to lead and manage, you're, you know? If
if your purpose is developing your people, that's what you're gonna drive and manage. Whatever is really important to you is what you're what you're gonna be driving, and you just need to be honest about it. Um, and you need if whatever that team purpose is, you need to like make your important decisions rooted in that, right? So for me, like for example, you take the ISEC values. So who, who can say what the ISEC values are? Anyone? Striving for excellence. Living diversity. Living diversity. Joint participation. What? Activating leadership. Demonstrating integrity. Demonstrating integrity and acting sustainably. Great. Uh, so those those are our values. The point of having values isn't to be able to memorize them. The point is that when you enter into difficult places or you don't know what to do, you can use those values as your guide, right? Because okay, I'm part of an organization that has this belief in the world. They're trying to make me into a leader. Therefore, this is a situation where I need to demonstrate integrity. That's what I'm going to do. This, this is tough, but this is the right thing to do. Or, the problem is, I'm not striving for excellence enough. That's the issue, right? These values help ground us. Um, also, based on your purpose, you should recruit people that fit with that purpose. You should fire people that don't fit with that purpose. Uh, and you should make strategy that's aligned with your purpose. So, for example, I, I, today in the IJP uh, room, we were talking about what markets can we sell to that's going to develop leadership and, be, and have an impact on Egypt. Right? So that's strategy being aligned with purpose. If your purpose is developing leadership and, and making a better Egypt, but your strategy is how can we bring as much talent to like uh, this industry, but it's not connected at all with developing leadership or impact in Egypt, that's not going to work. Because you're motivating your people saying, we're changing the country, we're changing people's lives, but what they're actually fighting for every day, like what they're putting so much work in, isn't doing those things. Right? That's why your strategy and purpose have to be aligned. Uh, sorry, can you go back? Back? Yeah, and, and the last thing is uh, around purpose. Like, ISEC, sometimes ISEC can be like an organization of inspirers, like people that talk about purpose and give inspiring speeches or something like that. And that's just cheap. Like, and that's not the leadership that ISEC should be creating. Like, if, if ISEC's impact in the world is that we create people that can tell a story that's impactful, but can't do something that's impactful, that's not the purpose of the organization. Uh, and it shouldn't be the purpose, it, it shouldn't be the purpose of your team either, right? It shouldn't just be talk, it should be what you do. And your purpose, like, if you're not out there booking sales meetings, if you're not out there selling TNs, if you're not recruiting as many TPs as possible, if you're not making sure the TPs you recruit are getting matched with good TNs, if you're not taking care of your TPs when they go on exchange to make sure they're developing the leadership and having a good experience, then to me, that purpose is bullshit. Like, it might be what you said you were doing, but it's not what you're actually doing. What you're doing is something else. I don't know, wasting time, recruiting people for shit experiences, uh, like raising TN in companies that don't matter or anything like that, right? So for, for me, like this, this purpose is what are you actually doing about it? Then I believe that there's a purpose driving it. Um, so uh, I want to talk to you guys about uh, about this. This is uh, I'm going to fill this with some bubbles in a minute. But uh, what I want to talk to you guys about is the hero's journey. Uh, I talked with uh, with the MCPs about this a little bit last night. Um, so, does anyone know what the hero's journey is? Hero, like a hero's journey? It's a, it's a, a narrative thing, like storytelling kind of thing. No? So it's a, it's a super common framework used in like human storytelling since the beginning of time. Uh, and, and there's very common traits in the story of heroes. So if you think of like Lord of the Rings, or Harry Potter, or Star Wars, or basically like half the stories that exist in the world that inspire us, uh, it, you're observing characters going through the hero's journey, right? So it, if you like, you can read whole textbooks about the hero's journey. So I'm going to make it like super, super simple, right? Um, but if we apply that to your team, like how does this, how does this like work for for a team? If you can click one time. So those stories start with some vision of the future and a gap, right? So for example, um, uh, Lord of the Rings or something. You have like happy hobbiton and you have the potential of a happy world, but there's a gap because there's evil in the world, right? So this is what we need to fix. It's clear that there's a thing that needs to be fixed. Or uh, the Odyssey with uh, uh, Odysseus and all that, like, so he's happy with his family, uh, but there's a war and he has to go to war. So this is, the, this is the thing that has to be fixed. He has to fight this war and get back to his family. Does that make sense? There's a, a vision of the future that needs to be accomplished, right? Now, then the hero goes on their journey. So uh, you can click again. Uh, if you're Harry Potter, you learn to be a wizard, you discover there's another really powerful wizard who wants to kill you. If you're uh, Luke Skywalker, uh, I don't want to give away the ending of the movies all of a sudden, but uh, 
right? If you're Luke Skywalker, you're supposed to save the galaxy from this evil empire. Uh, if you're Frodo, you're supposed to bring a ring to the mountain and everyone's trying to kill you and you're like this small, so you really have bad chances. Um, point is you encounter challenges, right? And like challenge after challenge, just every hero journey. You know, there's a monster and then they have to go to a pit or something like that, or the spaceship breaks down, there's all these things. There's all these challenges you run into. And you get to a point, and this is what makes the hero's journey inspiring for us. This is why we, we like these stories. You get to a point of the, the rock bottom of the hero's uh, of the hero's story, usually. Um, which is when you feel guilt or fear or exhaustion or anger. It's those moments when you say, like, I can't do it. I'm not the right person for this. Uh, or it's unfair, right? So can you, you can think of stories where, like, the hero is about to give up. Right? They're just about to give up because it's just so tough. And maybe you felt this way at some times in your life. Maybe not in eyesight. It might be in a relationship with someone. It might be in a sports team you were in. It might be with an activity you were doing. But you had hit rock bottom because of all of the challenges. So basically at that point, there's, there's only two things that happen. Either the hero fails and the story fails, uh, and it's a tragedy, right? Uh, or the hero finds a way forward and, and solves the challenges and, and has a great Right? So you click one time. Um, so with your team, that that breakthrough is going to come from their purpose, right? Because like, I mean, maybe your team doesn't get to these points, but sometimes teams do, right? You, your, your work is always more challenging than you think it's going to be. I think there's a rule with like team experiences and I said. If you have your plan, you have your strategy, you start implementing it, you run into bottlenecks, and it's never quite as easy as you thought it would be. Maybe it's super difficult and you end up here. Maybe it's not and you never have to go to that like dark place, right? But what takes you out of it is some determination, right? Some connection between, look, this is what I'm trying to achieve and, and I have to do it. I have to do it. So I don't care that these are the obstacles. I'm, I'm going to do it, right? For myself, by the way, who, who, who feels that they've had this kind of experience before in their lives? Yeah? Okay, most of you. Cool. So for myself, uh, I, I was experiencing this in this term, actually, my, my AI term. Um, because, you know, GIP, it's, it's a difficult program, and it moves slowly, let's say, like at least more slowly than, than GCDB or something. So uh, on, on AI, like Charlotte, Nikita, and I were trying to implement a lot of things, and we weren't seeing things changing on the ground, and it was becoming very, very frustrating. And uh, we, we had a team meeting with Rolf, and, uh, and I was, I was just becoming very frustrated, and I was feeling some of this, like, I'm not the right person. Like, why can't I fix this? Like, I don't know all the answers. It's really stressful. Um, and if I, and, and then also there's a feeling of guilt, because I was like, if I can't lead this, I'm just fucking up the organization I care about, and that's, like, horrible. Like, I, I don't want to do that. I love this organization and everything it's done for me, so I have to come up with the answers, right? Um, and and what, I, what I came to was, was really thinking, why is, this, why is this program really important to me? What is it that's led me here? And, and then I realized what strategy I wanted to implement. And that's actually the strategy I work on, uh, I work on with Mondo on the GST and several other GSTs. And that's about how can we make all of our, how can we make all of our TNs uh, really deliver leadership experiences to people that live them. And that's what I'm trying to, to leave now to ISAP, is that we have a GST program that's supposed to develop leadership in people and grow. And I'm, I want to leave a program that does develop leadership in people and grow. Uh, and that's like my mission. And because I have that, I, I no longer have these feelings, because I have this breakthrough for myself, because my, my purpose became very clear to me, right? And it was, it's completely related to my team's purpose, which is how do we develop leadership in every experience on a scale like before, what we call big ISAC, right? Um, does, anyone, does anyone have an example of, of when they, uh, sorry, just click one more time. Um, so you have this breakthrough from purpose, and then you realize success in the end of your hero's story, right? Does anyone have a, like, just super short, in one or two sentences, an example from their lives of when they've lived the hero's journey? Yeah? He chose a life path. So. He had a chance between having a good life and a chance between having a hard life, but it's actually Right. So you're you're somewhere past the rock bottom, right? Where you decide you've taken a decision, and now you're <clears throat> trying to make your breakthrough. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? It doesn't have to be something epic. It can be something simple. Yeah. yeah. Actually, about the about the bottom. Yeah. I mean, I left uni and my life is this. Yeah. And um, I was just 
or, or an individual in your team gets to there. It might not be your whole team, but it might be a person who says, I, I don't understand this process, or I've booked a ton of sales meetings and I'm not getting any results. Like, what leadership does it require from you? What do you have to do at that stage? Help me right here. But how would you do that? Give them the purpose. Remind them of the purpose, okay? Also, maybe help them discover their own purpose in this, right? Connect them with their own purpose. Yes? Right, giving them a vision of the future, right? Reminding them of that vision and saying, but what if you can overcome this? Then it will be, it'll feel like this and this and this. Anything else you can do as a leader? Yes? I think I mean, uh, the last time we were at the worst place and we have nothing to do. If we work with any other opportunity, something something Yeah. They could quit, but if they're not going to quit, then, yeah, then they can't get work, right? Anything else? Right? Help them, like, basically what that is, is it's like minimizing the amount that they see, right? Like, yeah, it's not that big a deal, you get over it, it's fine, you know? Okay, anything else you can do as a leader to help your team push through these moments? Or an individual push through these moments? Huh? <laughs> Sorry, what? Motivation. Sure. Sure. I think um, so. So, so I think this connects to the, the other two things I'm going to talk about in, in terms of leadership. Uh, on the one hand, yes, you need to help them. You need to connect them with the purpose and connect them with their own purpose, probably. So, why is this? So, these are the challenges you're running into. But why? Why do you want to achieve this? And if you're able to achieve it, like, what will that mean for your life? Or what does this mean for you, right? Um, but I think also as a leader, you need to be very demanding. I think that's like one one word I would add to what you guys have said because people. This is difficult to come out of rock bottom. Like it's not easy, and there's many areas of your life that you've probably chosen to neglect or give up on because this was too challenging, or you didn't want to invest the energy in it because you had other things, right? You had other priorities or something. So, like for me, for example, I would say like eating healthy is where I'm resigned and I'm not trying to break through. Okay, I'm just like fuck it. I'll deal with that someday in the future, right? There's different areas of life that, that we just that we do just like give up on, right? And and your members can give up. And they, I don't know, at least in, in my reality, and I suggest they have a lot of other options if they don't want to be an ISEC. They can be a lot of other organizations, they can do a lot of other things with their time, you know? So I need I need to be demanding of them and give them a reason and push them. Not not just show them the vision of the people, but really push them and also help them, support them, right? So whatever those mountains are, I need to give them the actual teaching that's gonna help them overcome it. Not just not just tell them that it's not a big deal, and not just motivate them, but also like, so here's how you overcome that one, and here's how you overcome that one, and I'm going to bring in this person to teach you how to do that, right? Anyway, point being, um, point being that uh, your purpose is something that is is something that should drive your team, and it's not just something you say; it's the reason you do things, and for that reason, it needs to be aligned with what you're doing. And when times get tough, you need to rely on this purpose to push people through that experience. And that is the leadership development within ISEC. It's not just the performance, right? It's not just the, the results that people generate. It's the difficulty they go through and the overcoming of those difficulties that they experience to get to those results, right? To the point that I would even say, if people are getting the results they're supposed to, then you should be putting your, then it means your ambition should be more, right? And I think that's what 2015 is for the organization, right? Then we need a bigger ambition because we need, a, we need something that's gonna challenge us so that we have to break through, you know? You click again. So, uh, just to, to recap some things about that. So, based on your team purpose, you make important decisions based on your values and your purpose. When you come to really important decisions, then it's not just about results or something. It, it's very much about what your values tell you, what the team purpose tells you. To give you an example, um, on AI, we've just made a decision for what vendor we want to use to develop a new mindset that right? It's a, over a $1 million project. It will last uh, like from beginning to end, including maintenance, not just the building of it, but from, from the whole, the life of the contract is like over three years. Um, there's, it's the biggest decision financially in, in ISEC's history. Uh, there's, there's never been a, a, a deal over $1 million decided by ISEC International. And as you guys know, how important is ISEC done that in your operation? It's like, yeah, without it, everything falls, right? 
Um, so it's a crucially important decision. It has to be done exactly right, right? In making that decision, AI, we didn't just analyze the results or something that, that an organization goes or how fast they can move. We also looked at what are the values of the people that want to work with us, um, and are they going to be are they going to be trustworthy? Are they the kinds of people that understand what ISAC is trying to achieve? Because if so, then we think there's going to be a successful partnership, right? We in making a decision so big, we went to what is our purpose in achieving 2015? We need an information system to do that, and what values do we have, and can we find a vendor that we would that, that shares those values? Think of it with your team. Think of it just like a relationship with a friend or a girlfriend or a boyfriend, right? I mean, you want someone with similar values, you know, and and you want to and you talk on a level of value. Uh, yeah, and, and based on your purpose, you also need to, to know what people do you need to fulfill that purpose and what people do you need to get rid of, and then and that's a fact. There's people you probably need to get rid of because they don't fit with your purpose or they don't fit with your culture or they don't fit with ISAC. Maybe. Yeah. They don't fit with it yet, and you should get rid of them, and then one day maybe they will happen for them to recover. Uh, and, and what strategy should you prioritize? So, like, the number one, maybe not number one, in the top five issues that ISEC faces is we always try to solve too many problems, right? Including myself. I'm always trying to solve way too many problems in ISEC. I should just focus on one or two. What helps you prioritize is understanding what your purpose is and what you really value. It was the same for myself with the strategy that I'm working on with Mondo about how we can make GIP relevant around the world, right? It's like, this is the purpose of our organization, and there might be other strategies that would lead to faster growth. There might be other strategies that uh, would that, like be more logically connected to what came before, but I believe this is the purpose of the organization, and therefore I'm making a decision to prioritize this strategy, right? Um, yeah, and also connected, who should your customers be, and how should you treat your customers? Who your customers are should connect with what your purpose is, and how you treat them should connect with your values, right? Um, so if we say that we're uh, an organization that strives for excellence uh, and activates leadership and demonstrates integrity, how many of, how much of our customer experiences reflect that, right? Not all of them, which means it's not enough. Yeah. So uh, before we go to performance, that's purpose. Does anybody have any questions about that? Or anyone would like to discuss anything a little bit? Purpose, but the stuff I've been talking about. If not, we can go on to performance. Yeah? Okay. So, I want to talk about performance. Yeah, so I, I like to make things like really simple. Uh, to make your team perform, you need to make them ready to perform. You need to make them perform, and then you need to help them perform better. So, I'm going to explain to you what those mean, but hopefully that's simple. Next. Okay, so this is about uh, preparing your team to perform. So this is a phrase I like to use, it hasn't caught on ISEC yet, so maybe it will now. Uh, I call it the early success window. And what that means is um, people, when they join the organization or when they join their team, they should see success very fast. If they, The longer they go without seeing success, the more likely it is that they perform at a lower level or that they just leave. Because people like to be successful. People do not like to be unsuccessful. It makes them feel bad. And if you're telling them that we're achieving this grandiose purpose and achieving all these results, they want to be a part of that as soon as possible, or else why are they there, right? So to me, the early success window is like the time when a member joins your organization or joins your team, that you have to make them feel successful to make sure that they'll stay with the organization. And this is very much based on my own experience. So maybe it's, maybe it's wrong, maybe I'm just too focused on myself or something. But when I joined ISEC in January 2008, I went to the IJFP team, and as a result of my first sales meeting, we raised the TN. So, as a result of the next, I think, 40 sales meetings I had, I didn't raise any more TNs or something, right? But in my first meeting, I did. So I thought that I was really good at what I was doing, and other people thought I was really good, right? That gave me a feeling of being successful, and I think, honestly, that's the reason I was in, I'm still in the organization. I think if I had gone two months, my first two months, and I'd gone to 10 sales meetings and hadn't had any success, I would have made up some excuse, I'm too busy, or I don't think it's for me, or I don't really like the culture of the organization, it's kind of weird, or something like that. I would have made some excuse and decided to leave the organization. But because I thought I was really good, it made me feel good about myself, and I had friends who thought I was good at what I was doing, and I said I stayed. So, um, some principles by having an early success window. One is to train people very, very fast. 
Uh, I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard people learn like 10% from training, 70% from practice, and 20% from feedback, right? So we, we know that factually, but is it reflected at all in what we do? Right? Most, most like LCs I know of, it's not. There's a lot of training going on and not very much practice going on. And practice is, of course, what's difficult and what gets you results. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so make all of the content they need to learn to do their job. So like, okay, this is our purpose as a team. For them to fulfill this purpose, they're gonna to need to know X, Y, and Z. So I've made those sessions, I know what I'm gonna do. Uh, and then teach it to them in a week, is what I would say. Like, teach it all to them in a week, max two weeks if you have to. Um, of course you have a member education cycle that follows up on all that, so it's not like that's the only education they're ever gonna get. But they should be ready to go and start performing, in my opinion, after a week or two. I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, I don't wanna override any team stuff here. No, we're good, we're good. She'll send you guys an email clarifying everything. Like, she was like, she knows the solution. I just added that to it. Even the way that we're closing and closing right now is uh, like we're going to have trainings or whatever, which are done quickly in a week or a maximum in two weeks. And after that, you have like different ways people learn during their performance phase. So probably I'm going on an appointment and like this has been uh, my sales uh, uh, time for this entire team. So actually come back and start then discussing. Uh, how did the sales appointment go? Because how, like, what are my key learnings from it? So the thing is that you're not giving them information because after a point you're not going to be able to provide it. It comes from their experience where you actually take the performance uh, forward and where you actually they discover how they can perform better. Like, mm -hmm. Not like here? Is it not like here, Mondo? And uh, yeah, exactly. And then give people assignments where they practice exactly what you taught them, right? Um, and, and I would say that that's from from week two, week three, right? So to make this very practical, when I led when I led my sales team, uh, like their first week, uh, like Monday, I talked to them about what is ISEC and what is GIP. And I think Tuesday, I had a training on uh, what our product is and how to sell our product, what the benefits are, the value proposition, the sectors we sell to, etc. Uh, I think Thursday I had a, a, a training on how to do a sales meeting and how sales meetings work. And then I think the next week we had a cold calling training. I had to do cold calling. And at the end of the cold calling training, there was a two hour cold calling uh, party of our, of our like, basically anyone from the LC who wanted to. Um, so we had like 20 people doing cold calls, including all the new members. And, uh, and, and so, and in the second week they were supposed to go on their first sales meeting, which my experienced members had raised in advance of recruitment to make sure that when the new members came in, they would have sales meetings to go on. Does that make sense? So by the end of week two, they've gone to a sales meeting, they've received basic training, they've gone to a sales meeting, and they've done cold calling, and they've tried to raise sales meetings cold calling. By the end of week two, right? So, yeah, that's what it should be. Um, I think that's a key part to getting your team to perform, is in, as early as possible, getting them to start doing things so that they feel successful. Next. Uh, another thing, so that's prepare your people now make them perform. So this to me is like the simplest thing. Uh, in any team, in ISEC, you should have something your team is supposed to do every week. Like, this is the weekly standard of what it means to be on the team. If you're doing this, it means you're committed. If you're not doing this, it means you're not working hard enough. Just fact, right? So, uh, for example, you just click. could be one sales meeting a week. It could be one EP raise per week. It could be that every account has moved one step forward in the process every week. And that, that's the minimum expectation. That could try, right? Uh, or it could be that every VP has moved one step forward in the process each week, right? But decide what it is that to you represents your team members putting forward enough effort to reach your goals and your purpose as a team. And whatever that is, that's just standard. And to me, it's not like a... So for example, the one sales meeting per week. So that was my standard when I was LCDP. I said if you're on the IJP team, you have at least one sales meeting every single week. And uh, my logic for that was, I mean, when I, when I joined, or sorry, when I, when I took over the IJP team, we might have, as an LC, we might have two to five sales meetings in a quarter, max. Any of you come from LCs like that? It's okay, you can be honest. I mean, I can check your CRM, so. <laughs> okay. Um, so very low sales intensity, right? And so to say that every sales person should have one sales meeting per week is like extreme, right? 
But I knew that it was possible. I knew it was possible to have one silicone per week if you were trying really hard. So it's even if it's way more than what we're doing, like it's I know it's possible because I can do it. So I know my team members can do it. So that's going to be the standard. And so I set that as a standard. Uh, yeah. So then you have this thing that your team is supposed to do every single week. And if they all do it, then you know that you'll reach your goals and your purpose as a team, right? So then you need to track it. So this is exactly how I would track my team. I'll do this for IJ, I'll show you this for IJP, I'll also show you this for OJ. So this is exactly how I would track my team when I was at LCVP. I would have each person, and then I would have basically their pipeline in a spreadsheet. So all of their contacts, all of the meetings, all of their leads, all of their team grades, team that, team three lives, team three ways, right? And I would be able to see from every team member what are, what have they achieved in every category? And and I would update it based on the CRM. So they all had to use the CRM because that's where I took the numbers from. If, if it wasn't in the CRM, it didn't exist, right? So from the CRM, then I would put this together and I knew exactly how my team was performing. Can you click again? Okay, so let's let's look at this uh, and why this is useful. Yeah, that's fine. So let's say you're managing this team. What should you do with units? He's had four contacts. No meetings, leads, TNs, 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 and those. Just four contacts. While everybody else has done all this. So as a team leader, what should you do? Yes? Put him on probation. Put him on probation. What does that mean to you when you say that? He's not performing. But what does probation mean to you? What does probation mean to you? Yeah. To give him a task, you know, put him, put him a chance before he gets into the Right. Exactly. Okay, that's one That's one thing you could do. To say, you haven't been performing. Uh, Here's your second. Here's your second chance, kind of. Uh, by then, by two weeks from now, I need you to have two sales meetings booked. And, and if not, I'm sorry. It seems like IJP and you are just not meant to be together. You can join another team, uh, or maybe you want to join another organization that's better for you, right? Okay. What else? Yeah. Recognition, right? So the, the minute you give them recognition, 
you risk also like taking away some of their motivation, right? So you give you give people honor, right? But uh, find find the right way to give them honor, right? And the right way here might be can you tell can you help the rest of the team do as well as you do, right? Uh, anything else? Yeah. I was going to add that I didn't actually take a task and put home. With someone, one of the leader actually they're not performing well, and they both can work together in one task. So that person will learn from it, and then they will perform better. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll give you some of the possibilities. Yes. Pipeline. Right. Ah, uh, this person should be the next team leader. Okay. I'm gonna start developing them. Yeah. Um, about pipeline, I think maybe that person is the wrong person. Maybe the functional meeting is not the right person. Yeah. Yeah, or or maybe maybe they should go on the meeting with someone else assigned to be giving yeah. feedback to the team member. Like raising the phone and asking. Yeah, there's yes. Maybe giving them a small leadership role, like right. a coordinator or something. Right. So so there's an important thing. Uh, some 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 people said give them more tasks, and some people said give them more responsibility. I would give them more responsibility and give them a more of a leadership role. Um, giving people more tasks isn't going to solve your problems. Because eventually that person is going to leave. They're either going to burn out or they're going to just go to their next role. Like they might do well for a year, but what are they building behind them? Um, basically, you've just used all of the energy from that person, right? Rather than invested in that person to have a return on your organization, right? So I, I, would, I would say give people more responsibility, not more work. Yes. Uh, okay, cool. Next. Uh, and what about Mondo? What should we do with Mondo? How do you sell meetings better? Yeah. Right, because, because he has six meetings, but five of the companies said they didn't want my sex product, and you see that two other people can sell better than that. So maybe you want to find out what he's doing in his sales meetings, right? Okay. Like, yeah, maybe walk me through his meeting, or I'll go with you on your next sales meeting, and I'll let you lead it, and I can give you feedback, something like that. Uh, or maybe maybe Taha and Mondo can work together, because Taha seems to have a really high conversion rate, right? So maybe you can find out what's Taha doing, what's Mondo doing, what's the difference. Huh? Well, it's not much in green. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, it's not the, it's not the question on the board yet, all right? Uh, okay, next. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, yeah, clearly Taha raises TNs, but he doesn't know how to match them. So, either he needs to learn how to match, or uh, maybe Mondo should be matching things and Taha should be raising more. Maybe there's a reallocation to be done. People working on their strength. Right? <coughs> um, but, but once again, you only know these things if you're tracking it. Right? This is, to me, like having a CRM and tracking is everything. Because not only not only like does this motivate your members, it motivated my members a lot when they could see like I have low sales meetings or I need to have more than that person or anything like that. Or just Here's the progress I'm making as a member. Like, yeah, last week I had this, and now I have this, and it's awesome, and the whole team sees that I have more. Um, but also, it gives you basically intelligence as a, as a team leader, how to support your people, right? And then in a team meeting, you're not just saying, you need to do more, you need to do more, you need to close, but you're saying, well, actually, I can see that this is what you're struggling with, so let me help you with that. You stop being a, a micromanager and more of a leader, right? More of a let me help you overcome the bottleneck to you achieving the results that you want to achieve. Okay. Yeah, so I think we've, we've sort of gone over this, but this is a question always to think about, right? So what what can I, what task can I give this person? What assignment, what learning, what resource could I give them that's going to help them overcome their bottom line? Right? Okay. So this is what it could look like for OJP. Um, so this is a little different. It doesn't look at the team member. Uh, it looks at the EP. And where they are in the process. The reason this is a little different for OGIP is um, often, like a person isn't as directly responsible for raising an EP uh, or preparing that EP as much as the organization is, right? So, like in, in IGIP, it's a person that raises a sales meeting, goes to a sales meeting, raises the TN. But in OGIP, it might more be an event, it might be an info session, uh, as well as preparation might be led by one fasting, but they they are not responsible for that EP. There's the person who facilitated the preparation, right? So I, I, I think, and I was talking to Marilla about this last night, that uh, it's maybe more useful to, to put the EP and where they are in the process. And it gives you insight on your team, 
more than on individuals, right? So let's uh, look at the question. One. Uh, so what processes does your OJP team do well if this is the result? Raising. Conversion from sign up to raise. So from ORS or info sessions, I think they do a really good job with that. Anything else? Uh, getting, getting the people to apply to TNS. Teaching them not to work with other individuals. Sure, sure, right, exactly. So whatever is between, whatever is exactly between those two processes. And maybe that's about it. Yeah? Okay. And uh, what does your OJP team really need to improve to get to their goal? Passive raising sessions. Huh? Passive raising sessions. Yes, so how to do the matching process, right? Because you, you, you lost 40% of the people that, or no, you lost the, Half the people that were raised by the time you get to the whole process, and only two of those people get matched. Okay. What else? Did? Okay, so uh, from this graph, I, I believe that most of the APs apply to TN, but they're not responded to or they did not reach the interview phase, which means that maybe there's something wrong with their CVs where their email address, so they need the, to do more branding for themselves. Yeah, maybe their applications are really bad, right? Yeah. The email they're sending or the CVs or something is just really bad. Yeah, but maybe they're applying, uh, but no one wants to interview them, so they don't have things, right? But once again, you only know if you're tracking, or you can only find out if you're tracking. Otherwise, you're saying, we need more DPs, we need more matches. It's like, okay, but what should I do as a team member? Or what training do I need to give my team? Or what, what, uh, what and it's not like, what, what speech do I need to give in our team meeting this week? Or what point do I need to emphasize, right? You don't know those things. What question do I need to ask the MC to help me with? Because my team isn't doing it right. You only know those things if you're tracking. And is there one more? No? Okay. Uh, yeah, you go. So how do you use these to make your team perform? Yeah, so you have to use tracking things like this, and you have to use them consistently. Like every single week, this is the, the basis. And the team meeting isn't going through and explaining everything. It's like assumed before the team meeting that everyone has seen this, and everybody's aware of this, and you're just giving a consultancy in the meeting, right? Like, yeah, we don't need to talk about whose results are what. You can see that in the spreadsheet. It's the same, the same in like a MC teams. I see, I see a lot of MC teams. They uh, they meet or something. They have their weekly meeting, and everybody updates what they did for like 30 minutes or 40 minutes. Maybe maybe you've seen that in your ED meetings. I don't know. Everybody updates on what they did. Yeah, I mean, you don't need someone to read you what's on a spreadsheet. Like come to the meeting and have already read that. What you need is to make decisions based on it. Right. And the same in your team meeting. You don't need to tell. You don't need to tell the team. Yeah, Noor did this much, Tark did this much, uh, Inesh did this much. You need to give the consultancy to everybody or give the training that's going to make everyone perform better, right? If people are not meeting the minimum standards, meet with them one time to understand why, set a plan for them, and if, if they don't do it, fire them, right? Uh, I, I personally very much agree with the sentiment that some people, I guess, were expressing that ultimately you can only leave people where they want to go. Uh, and and that's always every journey in ISAC is one individual journey, and you ultimately take responsibility for it. Right? I take responsibility for my roles in ISAC. Uh, you take responsibility for yours. And I have to. I think it's my responsibility as a leader in ISAC to provide a platform uh, where where you can develop yourself. And also, when you run into the challenge and you don't want to do it, to push you to to try to do it. I'm going to go the extra mile and give you the speech you need, the training you need, the coaching you need to to be able to do it. But in the end, it, in the end, it's, it's your journey, right? And if you don't want to go on it, I, I, it doesn't make any sense for me to like force you to, or or pretend that you're going to, which is more often the case, right? Yeah, okay. This member's been in the organization for four months. They haven't done anything, but we should give them a chance. But no, no, it's four months, right? It's, you can't just pretend that they're going to become a performing member. Give them the, give them a specific chance to become a performing member, and if they don't, that's what they're, they've made a decision. The decision they've made is they don't want to be a member. And, and be the role model yourself. So especially in IJP, um, especially in IJP, if uh, if you're making it transparent whatever his performance is, your performance needs to be very transparent as well. So when I was a team leader, for sure, I always made sure I had the most sales meetings and the most contract negotiating, most opportunities, etc. Because like as long as I'm doing it, then no one can make excuses that they that they didn't have time or anything like that because they all knew I was busier than them. I had better grades than them. Like everything, if I can do it, you can do it. Right? And if you're having trouble doing it, then I can teach you how, but you can put in the effort to do it. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about my sales team uh, to, to show you this is actually what I did. Okay, So the things I told you, this is actually what I did. This is a screenshot of the, the little CRM that I had for my sales team. You'll 
you'll see it's very similar. We had some different terminology than you guys have, right? But this had every member of my sales team. It had uh, their numbers, uh, and it, it had also the, the color coding, and based on if the number had changed since the week before, right? So if the number is in orange, it means it hadn't changed since the week before. If it was in white, then it had changed. So this way I could also see who was being active, right? Of like, what happened this week? You know, what did people do this week? So for example, like Tony didn't do anything this week. So in the meeting, I'm not gonna like be mean to him or something. I'm just gonna say, yeah, Tony, you didn't do anything this week. Is there a reason for that? He'll tell me the reason. I'll say, okay, well this week you have to do this. That's it, right? Or he'll say like, no, there isn't a really good reason. I just didn't get around to it. Okay, well you know the deal, this is the minimum, so I expect to see you next week. Thanks, let me know if you have any questions about it, right? Um, <clears throat> so, for example, what you can see from this is that you can, you can take the same kind of views. By the way, this was my team after uh, three months, right? So, yeah, after, after you know, our third month, yeah, we had 36 meetings with the sales team, and we were negotiating two contracts and stuff, and that's from a, an LC that was doing basically no sales meetings before, right? So my message here is you can drive a lot of sales intensity very quickly. You're on top of it, right? If you really push, if you're able to lead your team well, you can get a lot of sales potentially very fast. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, so, so this is what you can see. I had uh, the most meetings because I wanted to lead by example, but Maya was like super crazy at getting leads in the meetings. So I was always having to stay ahead of her. She was fantastic. She wanted to do great, great things in eyesight. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see Emma was like super good in sales meetings. She became uh, my successor. so. Very good in sales meetings. Um, you can see that uh, I was good, like from here. Let's say, like if the company was, if the company wanted it, I didn't lose track of it. I was good at managing my account, um, and I was like active in leads, but not the most active, let's say. And then you have a bunch of people that did like barely anything. So, so here's here's uh, here's this guy. This is the person that I had that probation talk with. I was gonna fire him, uh, and I said, look, I, I was just a front with him. I said, you haven't done anything. It tells me you don't want to do anything because you had enough time to do something if that's what you wanted. Uh, so do you want to be in this team? If so, then we need to do things differently. Say, yes, I want to be in the team. Okay, then you have two weeks, and in those two weeks, we need to see three sales meetings. Uh, and so he, he raised, uh, I think he raised two sales meetings, and I decided that that was okay, right? Because he put in the effort. You know, it's like he, he does what he hadn't done before, and he showed that he wanted to be in the sales team. So then he was. In the end, it just delayed things about a year, eventually he quit after not doing a bunch of stuff. But for that time, he was, he was starting to become a contributing member. So, uh, question for you guys. How does this compare to Isaac in Egypt? Say, 36 sales meetings in three months. That's, that's not an incredible number. Like, there's LCs around the world that do way, way more than that. But I just want to know how it compares to Egypt. So, LCs in Egypt versus the LCs in Egypt. So, LCs in Isaac in Egypt. You mean? <coughs> Huh? It's funny though how you compare like an LC to an ISP, just like you know, let me where you could compare that LC to all of ISP in Egypt. Is it similar to, to all of ISP in Egypt after three months? <laughs> yes, I <laughs> could. Yes? At least it was close. What, what about the most active, what, what's the most active LC in terms of sales meetings? See what you need to see what you can have. It's good for the last couple of the day. And how many sales meetings does see you have in a
encouraging LCMs, like, yeah, they like help the IJP team raise the sales meeting, go to this networking event, do cold calling with them, et cetera. So for example, um, Dan was the VP Finance, and Kelly and Jess were on the communications team, Emma was the VP Comm, and she became VP IJP after my turn. Uh, so we had people who, who weren't on the IJP team contributing, and uh, I don't know if that's like if that's like a good thing or not for us in Egypt. So I'm not saying like do that necessarily. Um, but the impact it had on my team was that uh, my team really had to perform because there's people from other teams doing their job, right? So it's like okay, if the comp members are raising sales meetings, like for sure you have to raise sales meetings. Like, there's no excuse if members from another team are doing their job and yours. Like come on. Um, yeah, and, and just to give you an example, this is a this is a, a screenshot of email I wrote to my team. Um, where I explained all this. So every week I was in an email like this. So, uh, yeah, here, here's the vision, right? The big picture is that we can each do a lot more as individuals to make this a top three sales team. That was what we want to do. We, our, our phrase was AZ top three. AZ was my only hair on stage. Um, so AZ top three was like we always said. So we want to be a top three sales team. And I was telling you, if we want to be a top three sales team, we have to do more. Uh, I looked at the trends of the whole team. So everyone has accountability. It's the whole team. No one in our sales team has a pipeline. There's a major difference in people's lead to conversion rate. I can help you with that if you want. Um, and the largest uh, contributors have been EV members, not from the ICS team, meaning the VP common and the VP finance, right? Uh, so they're supposed to help us, but they're not supposed to do our jobs. So that was my message to the team, right? And then, in one email, right, I would I put for everybody the sort of like one sentence coaching I would give. So it's totally transparent to everybody, right? So Emma, Vikas, and I are closing, but we aren't generating new leads. That's not okay. My, you both work on other people's leads, but your own have been uh, have suffered. Tony, in my team, you haven't done anything. Not even over. It's just, just like saying like you can't do that anymore. You have to do something else. Um, et cetera. You can see this. And then, uh, and then I was saying, so for this week, what we need to do is follow up. That's the focus of the week. And here's like links that you can do to raise meetings. Here's links you can go to to help you raise sales meetings, right? And and I've also had a weekly meeting with my team. So this is just like an email for them before we go into the Right. Just as an example for this, and and um, yeah, as I said, we had the most sales intensity in the country after three months. But I don't only want to emphasize the the performance of the team. Uh, I so often when I tell how I led my sales team, I think the impression people get is that I was like really harsh with my sales team, or I like drove people super hard or something. But but honestly, like the, these people developed a lot. Um, you can put through the next few. So we were the number one IJPLC the next year after my turn. US. Four of my sales team went on to the EB the next year. Uh, four went on to MST. Uh, one went to the MC, she's on the MC now, and one applied for MCP in another country. She, she didn't win, um, but she applied for MCP and she was amazing. So it was a very good team experience, right? We, we achieved our results, achieved our purpose, and uh, people, I think, developed a lot of leadership out of it. So that's the advice I have for you guys about, the, about getting performance in your team. Do you have questions around that? Any questions? Okay, then uh, then we're going to talk about the last thing, which is people, and how do you care for your people in, in the right way, at least based on what I think. Okay, whatever that is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what does it mean to lead people? For this question, it's the inner and outer journey. Uh, yeah, so we're supposed to bring people through that inner and outer journey, right? Uh, so leading people is outer journey. So the outer journey is about having individual responsibility and goals, right? It's about being in a challenging environment, having a support system. So as a team leader, for people that have an effective outer journey in your team, what do you need to do? Well, they have to have clear goals. For them to achieve those goals, you, you as team leader are responsible for giving them clear strategies. This is how we're getting there. This is the road, right? And you need to empower your team to achieve them. So for example, for me, setting a standard for my team of one sales meeting, um, so they had they had markets that they were supposed to sell, like industries they were supposed to sell in, and they knew they had to raise one sales meeting a week. Other than that, I didn't tell them what to do. Like, I would give them help or advice or something, but it wasn't like you have to make 20 cold calls, you have to go to two networking events, it's like, here's, the, here's what it means to be a successful member of the IJP team. If you do that, do it any way you like, any way that's best for you. So some people like to do cold calling, really, and, and would do that. Some people hated it and would go to just networking events. Or, uh, or use their warm leads. Whatever works best for you is fine, as long as it brings in the results. I empower my team to achieve the way they want to achieve. Be demanding. Push your team to strive for excellence. That's part of the challenging role and environment. If your team isn't being challenged, 
What are they really learning? You know? So be demanding of your team. Challenge them to do more. And make the team and yourself a person support system. So you know, people should people should be pushed to do more, but what should be pushing them is like the purpose of the team, but also the knowledge that everyone is, is there to help them. And, and, and if they need anything, you're there for them, right? And ideally, it's not just you, but it's the whole team feels that way, right? So imagine you're in a, a meeting with your sales team, and somebody's, and, and you point out, so uh, Mikey, uh, you've had lots of sales meetings, but you're not getting to opportunities, which means what you guys call leads. If you're not getting leads out of them, uh, do you know why? And so Mikey gives his self-assessment, yeah, I think this is the reason why. Does anyone have any advice for Mikey? Like, I don't have to say it, let's get the team involved, right? I can see what my team members are saying, they can give advice, and then if I think anything's missing, I can add to it, right? So get your whole team to be the support system. Uh, so about providing space for the average range. So the, 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 the team meeting is your channel to provide an average range, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know how often you guys meet in teams. You meet weekly in your sales team? Bi-weekly, like every two weeks? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So maybe maybe this is like anti-addiction. I don't know. I would recommend having like a regular meeting. It's just like this is the time we have a meeting every week or something. Um, yeah. I don't know if that works for you guys. Um, but in the meeting, that's where you can keep people clear on the vision and the goals, as Mondo was saying earlier. That's where you can track the goals and hold people accountable. And it's also where you can facilitate support for people's bottlenecks, right? So for example, if you see your whole team is struggling with something, you can give a training, like a 20 minute training in the meeting. It's for OJP or for IJP, right? Um, and uh, if, if, or if you see that a specific individual is having a problem, then you can ask the team, does anybody have advice for this individual on, on how they can do that better? Next. And about people's inner journeys. Um, so for, for inner journeys, my advice would be, we say the word journey, or if we say the word leadership, like both of those imply you're going towards somewhere, right? So if you're a leader, you're leading people to something. If someone's on a journey, they're supposed to arrive somewhere, right? So in someone's inner journey or outer journey, where are they trying to go? And if you don't know that, I don't think you can lead them so effectively, or at least facilitate their inner journey, right? Like what I mean by that is what person is your team member trying to become? You know, what is what are they value in life? What is their dream job? Uh, what are they trying to improve while they're in ISEC? What's their goal for this semester? You need to know what person they're trying to become. Then you can help them become that person. Otherwise, you're just sort of managing like a unit, and you don't know who the human being is underneath that unit. Um, I think it's useful if, if you know as a team leader, what are their limits in becoming the person they want to be? And how is their role helping them overcome that? Because then that gives you uh, insight into how to motivate them and also what advice to give them. So, so let's say a, a team member is trying to become uh, someone who's more bold uh, and risk taking, right? So, what are their limits? You can you, you can ask them that in the in, in your meeting with them. You, know, you can ask them. So, so what what why aren't you bold and, and risk taking right now or innovative right now? Uh, it's because uh, I feel a lot of pressure from home and I've never had to do those things and I'm afraid that if I try really hard I might fail and then that. Would Right? So you understand what the limits are, so then when they get into difficult situations, you can bring them back to that. You can say, well, you said that you wanted to be bold and innovative. You, that's, what, that's what you said. Uh, so I want to help you do that. So the bold and innovative thing to do is what? And then they can say, well, it would be this. But yeah, okay, so let's do that then, because that's the person you want to become. Right? So that's exactly what I, what I was saying. When they're having challenges, you can help them see those challenges as just part of their hero's journey. Right? So you said you wanted to be this person. And this is a challenge on the road there. We expected that, so don't freak out. Uh, and this is how you can come out of that if you want to be this person. And next. Right, uh, sorry, go back on. So a question I would often ask my team members if they were in a bind and they didn't know what to do, is I would ask them like, let's say you're in situations like this again in the future, based on your values and who you want to be in the future, what would you want your future self to do? And then for some reason it becomes clear to people, right? So, for example, like, when people are looking at their specific situation, things seem very complicated. But when you ask them, like, okay, if you were in the same situation with your kids or with your wife in 20 years, uh, what would you think the right thing to do is? Then it seems to become more clear for people. When they understand the person, or when they're thinking of the person they want to be, 
then it's easier for them to make the right decision in the, in the current time. Because in the current time, they're just looking at the immediate pros and cons, right? So then they're not making a decision as much based on their values and their purpose. They're making a decision based on like consequences, right? But you want to help them see the purpose and the values they act with, I think, so that you're helping them understand their personal values and reinvent themselves, part of the inner journey, the elements of the inner journey, right? So the, the spaces for the inner journey are the coaching sessions that you give them. Um, so just one second. Stop. So the, the coaching sessions that you have with them. So um, coaching is like a maybe a challenging thing for some people, like how, how to do coaching. There's there's one thing I learned in coaching that I thought was pretty cool, and that's that uh, instead of giving people feedback right off the bat, you can always ask them to give their self assessment. Right? How do you think you performed in the last month? How do you think you contributed to the team this quarter? Right? If somebody hasn't done very well, you don't have to tell them that. They'll tell themselves that, and then you can just. Be Okay, well, if you, I think your numbers say the same thing. If you feel that way, what do you want to do about it? You didn't have to, like, go, I don't know, be harsh with them or something and make them feel bad. They did that for themselves, right? And it's better, I think, if people are honest with themselves than if they're just, their leader is telling them they're not good, their leader is telling them they let them down or something like that. If they say, like, yeah, I think I haven't performed up to my best or something like that, it's much more powerful for people to admit or give a self-assessment, right? So, just one, okay, yeah. So understand people's self-assessment of their performance. Um, and, and that should be in the context of their values and their purpose as well. Like, do you so do you think you're making progress in your personal development? Do you think you, you, you said in the beginning of your term that you wanted to develop this in your term? Are you doing that? And they self-assess those things. Then you don't have to give them the feedback. Um, you should give them your honest feedback in addition to what they're saying, or if they're saying, or if you think they're not being truthful. It, it is your job, I think, as team leader, to be honest with your team members and say, my opinion is, this, that you're, you're not actually doing this, uh, or something. And that can be tough, that can be really challenging to be very honest with people. Um, for example, saying things like, I feel like you're scared. That's not something people usually say, right? Like, whoa, right? But the way I look at it, you are this person's leader. There's not, I don't know if they'll ever have someone in the rest of their lives who's responsible for their personal development the way you are. Many of the companies they would join or future jobs they'll have, they should, Team, their, their manager, their team leader, won't have the same approach of developing this person as you do, right? So if you're not going to be honest with them and give them the real feedback they need to develop themselves, maybe they'll never get it. This is your chance to give them a true and honest mirror, right? And I think that you owe that to your team members, right? And I know it's challenging. I've, I've been a team leader. It's really hard to give people honest feedback and say things like, I think you're scared or um, I think you can work harder, you know? Say like I don't think you're working as hard as you should, or as you can, or I feel like you want to do things your way and not listen to me because you need validation, you know. Or just saying I think you need validation. From me. That's like harsh feedback, right? Like I don't know if someone said that to you and you were a member, I think you'd have been like, whoa, or maybe even offended, right? But if that's true, someone should tell you that, and it's it's better for you to learn that now than to deny it your whole life or to learn it in ten years or something. Yeah, I need validation too much. That's a good thing to recognize. In your Um, if you know what person your team member is trying to become, you should be fighting for that person, right? So for example, when you're challenging your team member and saying, you know, I think you can work harder, or I think you are trying too hard for validation, the reason you're saying that is because you are standing up for their future self. Does that make sense? Right? It's like you're defending the person they want to become, even at the expense of being a little hurtful or harsh to the person they, they're being at that second, you know? The person you're fighting for is the better version of themselves because that's what they're trying to be and that's what you want them to become. You want them to become the best version of themselves, so you're going to hold them accountable to that standard. You know, I, I know the best version of you does this, and I'm not seeing that, so I want to see that. Can you do that? Right? Um, yeah, and, and you can make changes in people's roles or give them assignments that are going to help them develop things to be more successful. So you, this, this is basically my advice to you for how to coach your team members, right? Ask for their self-assessment. If you have anything to add to their self-assessment, add it, be honest with them. Then help like, un like uh, help them become the person that they're trying to develop into from their role. And if you need to make any changes in the leadership of the team, meaning, I think you're, I think like, let's, let's say we're looking at IJP, right? So I think that uh, you really excel in the raising process, and I want to make sure that uh, we're able to raise as much as possible. And I think you can contribute more there, and you'll also be more successful and develop if you wanted to. So let's concentrate more on raising 
And when you raise the TM, let's have this person match it. And I'll talk to them to make sure that's okay with them, right? So you've changed their role in some way to make them more successful, and ideally that's aligned with the person they're trying to become, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, and you can also have team days for the inner journey. So this, like, the two spaces are your coaching meetings and then team days. You can just click and do. Um, yeah, so, so team days is about shared reflections. People share their reflections of people's challenges, their accomplishments, what they've learned. Uh, honest feedback between team members and also the team members to you, I would say. Um, it's also where people can understand each other's values, like really understand, okay, that's, what, that's the experience this person is living. I didn't know that. Um, and ideally, your team day people are visioning the future and making commitments, right? So, for example, if they say, if they've gotten feedback that they uh, are too selfish in the team, or they uh, don't communicate what they're doing well enough to the rest of the team, um, then this is a chance for them to say, yeah, so I got feedback today and I think it's true, so for the next quarter of our team, I really want to commit to doing this. And they commit to that with their whole team or something, right? And so then, then also, if you're coaching with them, you have a you have a new thing to hold them accountable to, right? Okay, this quarter you said the thing you wanted to work on to be more transparent with your team. Uh, how do you feel you're doing at that, right? So you, you have the person they're trying to become, also the person they're trying to become in the short term, the thing they're trying to develop based on feedback. And and this is just an addition to that I would add. Uh, I would I would add surprise surprise your team and do thoughtful things for them. Um, so this this I, I put this here basically because of Florence, who was the last PAI for all. He was fantastic at doing extremely thoughtful things for his team. And it just meant so much to people, and they were, they were truly great. So, for example, when we arrived, the new AI team, we had a, we had a dinner, or like a, like, let's say like a happy hour, like, like snacks and beers and stuff like that with the outgoing team uh, on like the first day. And uh, he, had made, uh, he had made picture frames with like pictures in it of all of the members who were on our team as well. So like the people who were doing two terms in a row, and he made like a speech acknowledging those people, uh, saying like, yeah, the the responsibility it is to be on two AI terms and to live two AI terms is like so much, and he really thanked them for like giving two years to the organization in such a challenging role. So that was unexpected, right? But it meant a lot to those people, and it also helped connect that team to our team, right? Um, another another example, uh, um, he. Uh, I'm trying to Ah, for their for their team day. So so in their in their transition when they were an incoming team, uh, they they really you might have heard like Florence and that AI team talk about like being a crew before, uh, and it was related to like uh, sailing on a boat, right? So the metaphor they had for their team was that they were that they were like a team of a team that was like sailing in in the sea, and they needed to work together to like sail their boat, and that's why they were a crew rather than like a team, right? So in their first team days, what they did was uh, they they went out on a lake. In, in the Netherlands, and they had to build boats, and and then they like raced those boats, right? So in every like sub team, like the operations team, the like uh, innovation and IM team together, the DXP team, etc., they had to build a boat and then race it, right? So like it was connected. It was a surprising thing to do that was connected with their purpose and also connected the people in the team, right? I, I really recommend you guys think of these thoughtful things you can do that will surprise people. Um, it makes it just makes them feel that you really value them because you put in some special thought that it wasn't expected. Uh, yeah, so, so this is just it's kind of a recap. What do people need from you? Uh, or what do your people need from you? I think they need your honesty, even when it's difficult, as I was saying. Um, they need to be held accountable by you, especially if firing them is what they need. So again, like if this person isn't hardworking enough, or like uh, doesn't listen enough, or anything like that, like they're going to get fired from, from jobs in the future if they don't change this. So as as le as a leader, to prepare them for the rest of their lives, this is what you should be preparing them for. Okay, if you go to do this in the professional world, you're gonna suck, and you're not gonna bring value to anybody, and then you're gonna not have a job, and that's gonna be bad for you. So I'm gonna send this message to you now, and you can try to apply again next quarter. Or I don't know if that works for you. Uh, yeah, and, and you need to support them in overcoming their bottlenecks. That's what people need from you. Uh, just to recap some things. Uh, so yeah, as, as team leader, I, the simplest way I would put it, you're responsible for the purpose of your team and reminding them of that purpose and leading them through the hard times so that they can break through and achieve that purpose. Uh, you're responsible for driving their performance, which means you really need to have a clear standard of what they're supposed to do, like prepare them. Okay, this is what we do as a team, you've gotten your training, now go do it. Doing it means you do this much every week. Um, I'm gonna track you, we're gonna see each other's performance, 
uh, completely within the team, and then when I see your trends, I'll be able to give you advice and coach you to be a better team member. Um, and you also care about your people. Uh, so, we can, we can be done. I'll just ask if you guys have any questions about any of that. Or thoughts. Sorry, what? Okay. Anything? Okay. Thank you, guys.